Good morning. I want to welcome you to worship at Willow United Methodist Church here in Willow, Alaska on this Sunday in July, July 19th, 2020. My name is Christina Dowling Soka, and I, along with uh, my spouse, Joe D., are the pastors here at Willow. We are thankful that you are worshiping with us this morning, and we particularly welcome you if you are worshiping with us for the very first time. Our service is a very special one. We are thankful, as always, for our wonderful accompanist, Mary Lemmings, who will accompany our hymns. And today we have a special treat in that James Davenport is reading the scripture for us. And we have a special musical piece played by Amanda Dale. Amanda is going to be playing It Is Well With My Soul. She's playing it in memory of Melinda Dale's father and her grandfather, Richard M. Davidson, who died, he passed away just a few days ago. We are thankful for all who are participating in this service, and we do invite others of you to uh, consider reading a scripture or sending in a special music piece as well. We pray that this will be a very special service of blessing for you. Thank you for joining us. invite you to join us in the greeting, which you'll find printed in your bulletin. To know the warmth of love. To have the assurance that someone cares. To be confident of our word. To be bold in love in return. To be washed over with grace. To be accepted as we are. This is to know a bit of God. Then let us worship our God. Our hymn of praise is You Are Mine. You'll find the words in your bulletin or in the faith we sing.
invite you to join me in the community prayer. Holy God, holy breath, wind, flame, spirit, set our hearts on fire, burn off all that is dry and lifeless, and grow us anew. Let your spirit dance within our spirits, uprooting us when we have been unmoved, and refreshing all that is stale in our lives. Breathe on us your peace. That we will share that peace with all we meet. And hear the silent prayers of our hearts. You are invited to silent prayer of your heart. Breathe deeply, reflect, and rest in God's presence. people said, Amen. Amen.
this time I'd like to invite the children to come up front, come up close to your screen for the children's time. Good morning. I've been thinking about a, a big word, an important word, and the word is encourage. Can you say that? Do you know what the word encourage means? I think it means putting courage into someone, helping someone to know that even though they are small, they can do big things, that they can find their own special talents, that they can find a new hope. It's kind of like you're clapping and cheering for someone and saying, you can do it. I believe in you. You're a special child of God. And I believe that we all are called to be encouragers. And we're going to be thinking about encouragement and particularly the story of a man named Barnabas in our service today. I am so thankful for all of the encouragers in our world. And maybe people encourage by phoning someone up and or maybe they write, maybe they paint them a beautiful masterpiece, a, a beautiful picture, or they write a card, or they give an air hug, or they find time to, uh, to, uh, to play uh, or Zoom with a friend. I was uh, particularly thankful for the, all the encouragers in our community, and I'm so proud of a group that's called Willow Rocks. They're having a lot of fun. They're finding rocks. And some of them have been doing this for a long time, others more recent, and they've been painting beautiful uh, pictures on the rocks or words of hope, words of encouragement. This is one I found out by the church sign. Can you see it? It's, oh, it's so pretty. It's, it's got a little forget-me-nots. And then on the other side, it says this important encouraging word, don't forget to love. Others uh, look like this. I'll show you some of the rocks that are in our community. Look at those, aren't they amazing? Don't give up, today is your day. It's okay to be different. Oh, and those beautiful, beautiful animals and critters, they just bring a smile to your face. Oh my goodness, so many rocks, they're amazing. Aren't they beautiful? And, uh, I was thinking about those rocks. The idea is that you, you find a rock and then you hide it again. You paint a rock and, and you hide it. And then when you uh, have it for a while, you hide it for someone else. And the, and the love and the hope keep on spreading. It reminds me of when you take a rock and throw it into a lake. Have you ever done that? You watch it. And what happens is on the water, the ripples go out farther and farther and farther. And so when we encourage someone, when we help them to believe in themselves and to believe in God, that hope starts to spread. When we challenge them to do good things, the, the hope and the dreams and the challenge keep spreading out. And Jesus' love is like that. Jesus encourages us. He says, I will be with you always and nothing can separate you from my love. My prayer is that we will encourage one another this week. Let's pray. You can pray after me. Dear God, thank you so much for people who encourage us. Help us to encourage one another. Thank you for Jesus, and thank you that we are special children of God. Amen. Let's sing Jesus Loves Me. Our epistle lesson this morning is from Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's 
masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Our second reading is from Acts 11, 19 to 26. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that took place over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and they spoke the word to no one except Jews. But among them were some men of Cyprus and Cyrene who, on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists also, proclaiming the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number became believers and turned to the Lord. News of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast devotion. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for an entire year they met with the church and taught a great many people, and it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, I give you thanks for each one who is worshiping with us this day. I pray for each person. You know their needs, you know their hopes, their dreams, what they're going through right now. I pray that these words might be a blessing, that they might bring hope and encouragement, challenge and grace. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. When you hear the words, God's masterpiece, what do you think of? Do you think of the beautiful colors of a sunset or a sunrise? Do you think of looking up at a field on a clear starlit night? Do you think of seeing the northern lights? Or the beauty, this week I was driving along and oh, the beauty of the purple and the pinks of the fireweed and the other flowers just bursting forth, it was breathtaking. Or maybe you're driving at sunset, maybe that's even as late as 1 a.m. in the morning and you're on the parks highway at that point where Denali peaks up and it's one of those nights where the colors are just amazing and you stop and think oh how amazing God's masterpieces are but I wonder this morning do you ever consider yourself to be a masterpiece of God because you see I think that's what the scripture calls us to be when we live in Christ Paul uses a little phrase in Christ over and over again I think over 200 times in his writing and what he's talking about is that in Christ, we take on a whole new way of living and thinking and breathing and being. As Christians, we reflect the love of Christ. We reflect love of God and neighbor. We become a beautiful masterpiece. There's a verse that says it specifically, the one that James read us in the book of Ephesians, where it says, we are God's masterpiece. God has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I love that verse in Ephesians 2. It was an important life verse for John Wesley. I suppose you could say it was one of his central key verses, a verse all about grace because you see God pours God's grace into us and then it becomes so, we become so full of God's grace that we can't help but to share that grace with those that we meet, to try to be persons of hope and grace in our world. Do you know that you are one of God's masterpieces? What do you see when you look in the mirror? Do you look in the mirror in the morning and see and marvel and wonder at God's handy, handicraft? Or do you look in the mirror and say, oh my? <laughs> what if we looked in the mirror and said, wow, that is a child of God. To be sure, some of us are a little bit weathered and it's hard to get our hair always fixed just right. 
There's a story of a little girl who climbed up into her grandma's lap. The grandma was all wrinkled, beautiful, all wrinkles, crinkles, smile lines. And the little girl said, Grandma, did God make you? And the grandma said, yes, God made me. And then she said, and she looked at herself, she said, did God make me? And the grandma said, yes, God made you. And then the little girl with a fun little smile on her face said, Grandma, don't you think God's doing a better job now than he used to? <laughs> Sometimes all we see is the wrinkles. What do you see when you look in the mirror? Maybe the greater question is, do you see? Do you see that you are God's masterpiece and that he can make beautiful things out of the dust of our lives? It's a little bit hard to comprehend the power that God has placed within each one of us, the dreams that God has for each one of us that we might be called forth into this new existence and truly reflect the beauty of God's grace. Sometimes we get a little awed by that thought. I like what Marian Williamson says about this. She says, our deepest challenge is not that we are inadequate. She says, our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, she writes, who are you not to be? You are a child of God, and your playing small doesn't serve the world. We are called to live into God's dreams, to let God work and paint God's magic in us. These next few weeks, we're going to be looking at what it means to be God's masterpiece. And we're going to be looking at several characters in the book of Acts. I wanted to depart from the lectionary a few weeks this summer and really focus on the book of Acts because I think it speaks particularly to this context, to our context in our world today. You see, in the book of Acts, the church was having to imagine itself for the first time, and we're having to reimagining ourselves. And they didn't get to gather in beautiful uh, sanctuaries like this. They mostly met in homes, or they were out in the street. They were healing and teaching, and they were lifting one another up. They were serving one another. They were the church on the street in those early days. And out of those early days, God raised up several characters that we're going to look at. We looked at a little bit of Paul's story a couple weeks ago, but now we're going to focus on a person whose name is Barnabas. You find his story in these opening chapters of the book of Acts. His actual name was Joseph, but they called him Barnabas because the word Barnabas means son of encouragement. I think we can look a lot at learn a lot as we look at the story of Barnabas. I wonder this morning, are you an encourager? Do you live with your cup half full or is it always half empty? Do you see the good in others? Do you treasure the persons that you meet? It's not that you just totally ignore their flaws because sometimes those flaws have to be dealt with. Sometimes there are boundaries that you have to hold on to. I'm more talking about though, about ordinary encounters where we're called to lift one another up and to be uh, agents of hope and healing in our world. I want to look at Barnabas and think several things about his character and perhaps what they can teach us. First of all, I notice how generous a person Barnabas is. Uh, Joe D. usually at the end of our services each week talks about how important generosity is, how important it is to be generous with ourselves and with our church and with one another. Well, Barnabas was one who knew what generosity was. In chapter 4, it says this, there was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, and then he brought the money and laid it at the disciples' feet. What a radical thing to do. I know that money would have been hard to come by, and in the story of Barnabas, you see him investing everything, selling this field, and laying the money at his disciples' feet. You see, the people in Jerusalem had gone through, the Christians in Jerusalem had gone through hard times, and they were hungry, and the disciples were gathering this offering to take to him. And here you see Barnabas giving his whole, his heart, his life to this church that he loved. He was radically generous. I think he was also what you might call a heart whisperer, a person who builds a person up and helps them to see who they can become. 
I came across this little phrase, heart whisperer, in a lovely little essay written by Marianne Bird called The Whisper Test. She talks about how, as a child, she was very insecure, that she was often bullied, often excluded. She didn't think that anybody else loved her except for her own parents. She was born differently. <laughs> she was created differently. Her face was a different shape, and, and her, her teeth weren't even, and she had a hard time to speak. And she felt uh, very insecure, as she said. She didn't know that anyone else could accept her outside of her family, and yet... There was a teacher who made a difference. The teacher's name was Mrs. Leonard. She was a, a short, sparkling, vibrant, happy woman. Each year in their class, they had what they called a hearing test, a whisper test. And what would happen is to order to see if you, uh, if you're, if you were hearing okay, the children would be called one by one up to the desk, and the teacher would whisper something, and you would say it back just to make sure your hearing was okay. And so it might be something like uh, the sky is blue or, or your shoe is, is untied, might be whispered something, it's just an ordinary phrase. Well, when Mary Ann came up to the desk, I think that this teacher knew what was going on in her little heart. And so she said seven words, seven words that Mary Ann says forever changed her life. She whispered these words, I wish you were my little girl. And suddenly, Marian says it was like this, this wave of hope and love and acceptance poured down upon her, and she was forever changed. You know, not all of us are, are born differently, but all of us need Jesus as our Lord, and we need Jesus' love, and we're called to whisper to each other, you are accepted, you are loved, you are claimed by grace. Barnabas was a whisperer like that. He was a person who didn't focus on a person's mistakes and their failures and their brokenness, but who, who focused, he, he sort of had visions and dreams of who a person could be, become, and so he would describe to that person who they could become, and he taught them how to look and live into those visions that God had for them. I think that Barnabas often focused on person's potential rather than on their broken past. You see him doing that in Acts chapter 9, verse 27. You find Barnabas introducing Paul, welcoming him into the church. The rest of the people, you remember, don't, don't trust Paul. Paul had a problem. He had had... He had uh, been on the wrong path. He had been arresting Christians, and then suddenly he has this conversion experience. And in the midst of that, you uh, see the other Christians not sure whether to believe him or not. But here you have Barnabas introducing Paul to the leaders of the church in Jerusalem and saying, you can trust him. We've heard his word. We've heard his story. He is authentic. He is real. The words go like this, when he had come to Jerusalem, Paul attempted to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him. They did not believe he was a disciple, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the disciples and described for them how on the road he had seen the Lord who had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of the Lord. To be God's masterpiece, to be a heart whisperer is to help others see the beauty that is being formed in us. Help others to see how we are not defined by our past failures, but how we can become whole and reflect the glory of God in all that we do. This business of whispering dreams, and it reminds me of the stories that are told about this great artist, the great sculptor, Michelangelo. He made those beautiful statues as well as wonderful paintings, and uh, stories are that he he, uh, oh, you remember the, the statues, statues like David, or I love the Pieta, where uh, Mary is holding Jesus in the wake of the crucifixion. Such amazing statues. And the story goes, uh, I don't know if it is legend or true, but it's a beautiful story, that he would often carve these out of pieces of marble that the other artists had rejected. And he would often say, particularly of one angel that he had carved, that, that he would look at the stone and, uh, and try to see uh, and, and use his hands to, to break free the character, the, the, the sculpture that was hidden 
in the stone. He said, uh, it's t- said that Michelangelo once said, I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set the angel free. That's the kind of action that Barnabas' encouragement does for the other characters in this book of Acts. Ralph Dunn says the word encourage means to put courage into. And I love the Greek root word that is translated as encouraged in the New Testament. It's the word parakalatos. It's a word that is used so many times, used 109 times in the New Testament. And it's uh, the verb form of the noun uh, paraclete. And paraclete, of course, is the word that's used for the spirit. It's used for the word of the one who is the advocate, the one who walks alongside us. And paracolatus means to come alongside, to walk alongside, and to encourage and to bring hope. Sometimes it means to comfort or to exhort. It's being there, standing with one another when the world is tough. There's so much in our world that needs to be healed, so much that is broken, so many times that we need courage in our hearts just to make it through another day. And church, that's what we are called to be for one another, to bring hope and courage and healing in the midst of this world. You don't have to look far to find the discouragers. Oh my goodness, so much discouraging. I get very saddened by all the hard words that you hear, so many hate-filled words, and yet we are called to turn the narrative around. We are called to be the encouraging word. It's easy to fall into discouragement. It's easy to see the flaws and the faults in one another. I think of on Sunday mornings, I don't know about you growing up, but when the paper would come, Mary and I would rush to uh, get the paper and we'd be looking for one page in particular. You know what page it was, the the colorful uh, page. And we particularly liked, I particularly liked one of those comics. It was called Peanuts. And there's a book called The Gospel According to Peanuts that I read long ago. But I was thinking about two different uh, contrasting strips. In the first strip, there's little Linus. And he's writing a comic strip of his own. He's kind of chortling as it. He hands it to his sister Lucy and says, Lucy, tell me whether you think this is funny. And then you see Lucy looking at it, and she's reading it, and this wonderful smile is coming on her face. She's starting to laugh. And then... uh, She, in the next frame, she says, well, Linus, who wrote this? And Linus says, well, I wrote this, looking so proud and with a big smile. And then the next phrase, you see old Lucy ruining it all. She wads up the the, uh, comic strip and throws it to the side and says, well, then I don't think it's very funny. And in the final frame, you see Linus there with his little blanket over him, comforting him, his little thumb in his mouth. And you hear him saying, big sisters are just the crabgrass in the lawn of life. (laughs) Have you ever been crabgrass in the lawn of someone's life? It almost sounds like a country tune. I'm I'm fond of uh, teasing and saying that I should have been a country music song artist. And I think I even sang for you uh, some uh, recently, some long ago, uh, a hit tune that I thought should have been a hit tune that I wrote when our uh, gas line was broken at camp and I made up a song, I don't want to be trash. I don't want there to be trash in the gas line of my soul. (laughs) Well, it's a longer story for another day, but I got to thinking about this this, uh, comic strip and wouldn't a good country tune be, I don't want to be crabgrass in the lawn of life. Uh, You you think about uh, those words, Um, Actually, my uh, experience is wanting to be a a country singer went back way early. Uh, Mama was a music teacher, and she would sometimes for the weekend bring home her wonderful auto harp. Uh, You know one of those auto harps where you push the buttons and you strum the chords? And I love to sing that old song, Home, Home on the Range. And, you know, it goes where never is heard. A discouraging word, my voice would little warble it out. Never was heard a discouraging word. And the skies are not cloudy all day. I think maybe my first contact with the word encouragement uh, was the word discouragement. Of course, encouragement is the opposite of the word discouragement. But it's easy in this life to get discouraged. Because there is so much that is broken. 
so much that we see within ourselves, within our structures that needs changing. The sky does get cloudy. There's so much hurtful, abusive speech. I'm embarrassed by the hate that is spread. Someone once said that in a normal day, you can find six negative things to one positive, and we have to turn it around. And that brings me to the, I said there were a couple of comic strips, that brings me to the little comic strip of, of uh, Linus turning it around. Lucy is there and now she is the discouraged one. She's never felt so low in her life. Linus encourages her to count her blessings. Lucy says, I've never had any blessings. She says, I could count my blessings on one finger. There are no breaks. I never get any breaks and nothing goes right for me. And then she turns and lambasts her little brother. She says, you talk about counting blessings. You talk about being thankful. What do I have to be thankful for. And then he softly says, well, for one thing, you have a little brother who loves you. And you see Lucy pause. And it ends up with, with her giving Linus a big hug. And Linus saying every once in a while, I say the right thing. Ah, church, we are called to be the Linuses of the world. We're called to be the Barnabases of the world who speak hope, who speak love, who speak grace. We're called to have the eye of, of, of Christ, to see one another through the eyes of Christ. That's what, what Barnabas did. He kept seeing others through the eyes of Christ. We go from chapter 9 to chapter 11. The spirit has broken loose in the town of Antioch. Antioch is where the disciples, you remember, were first called Christians. They needed leader. And so they chose Barnabas because he was an encourager. They needed people who could fan the flame. But Encouragers are often te always team players. They draw others in who can help them. And he thinks of, of, uh, of who can help him, and he thinks of Paul. This same great leader is just sitting there in Tarsus, still trying to figure out what to do with his life. And Paul and Barnabas sends for Paul. He was still then called Saul. He sends for Saul and, and brings him to him in Antioch, and he teaches him for a whole year. And then they go off and start to change the world town by town, person by person, missionary by missionary journey. And amazing things, what would have happened if Barnabas hadn't been encouraged? What would happen to the story today if, if, if he hadn't remembered to go and to seek out Paul and, and to whisper words of hope, help Paul see who Paul was called to be? I love it also that Barnabas is forever humble. <laughs> At the beginning of the story of Acts, you see him taking the lead. It's always talked about Barnabas and Saul. But they come to this point at Crete where the leader is healed, and after that, it is Paul and Barnabas. You see, when you are truly an encourager in the style of Christ, it doesn't matter who's first and last. You, you let one another take the lead. Now, Barnabas wasn't perfect. He struggled at times with inclusion theology. He and Paul had mighty arguments. You see him doing amazing things when Paul uh, has troubles with another person called John Mark. It's Barnabas who again sees the good in Mark and, and helps in those broken work where brings brings John Mark back in. I think about where the early church would have been without Barnabas. We might not have had that great missionary called Paul. We might not have had the book of Mark. I'm glad for Mark's sake and for Paul's sake that Barnabas was an encourager. I wonder this morning whether we too are called to be encouragers in the style of Barnabas. Encouragers who see that we are called to be God's masterpiece, to make a difference. And we can't do it alone. I've been thankful this last few weeks for a clergy small group that I've been a part of. I've been so troubled by some of the structural injustices that I see in our world. So we've, we formed a little group to uh, talk about how to uh, live into a world that is, is not racist, that, that is, is more whole, more complete. And so we're reading a, a book called So You Want to Talk About Race. And I love how we can encourage one another. My prayer is that we, as a whole church, we'll encourage each other, particularly in this time when we are apart. Maybe we will write a note. I love the letters that I get in my box from some of you. Maybe we write a note to each other or pick up the phone or, or pray a prayer. We find ways of lifting one another up. I hope that you will never underestimate the power 
that God has placed in you to make a difference in this world. Never underestimate your power to uh, encourage someone to set them on, the, on their feet, to lift them up, to see, help them to see the angel in the rock. Will you let your light shine? You see, light that is open to Christ is contagious. I love what God says, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. We do get discouraged, and yet to receive and to give the gift of encouragement means knowing that we are not going to be defined by the past. We will let go and look beyond the labels, persecuted, homeless, addicts. Suddenly we are saved by grace and we are defined not by our problems, but we are defined by the beauty of what God can use even out of the rubble of our lives. As we close this message, as we get ready to be sent out in this week, there are several questions I would like us to ponder. First, I wonder, are you whispering courage into someone else's life? Are you seeing the angel in the stone? Are you embracing humility? Are you embracing goodness? Are you willing to walk alongside someone? Who can you be a Barnabas to? And then I also want you to think about who can be a Barnabas to yourself, because sometimes we have to ask one another if we will walk alongside each other. Are you ready to open your heart to letting someone to a group maybe walk alongside of you? You see, together we can make a difference. To really be God's masterpiece has to do with encouraging one another to let God paint God's beauty, God's magic in our lives. What do you see when you look in the mirror? Can you hear God whisper to you, I'm so glad. You are my child. You are a child of God. Claim the blessings. Claim the love. Claim the courage. Claim the hope. You see, he sees the angel in the stone. It's time to shine with the angels, church. Time to be God's masterpiece. It is time to shine. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we give you ourselves. We may feel broken and hurting this morning, but we know that you are the great healer and that you can take the broken pieces of our lives and that you can help us to stand strong, that you can help us to shine, that you see the beauty in the rubble. Make us, create us, restore us, redeem us, free us up to be the masterpieces you created us to be. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
to our time of prayers. And we have, uh, during this time of doing remote worship, we've been using the uh, prayers of the people out of the United Methodist hymnal, and it is fitting prayer. Fitting prayer is an ancient practice uh, of the liturgist, which would be me in this case, of lifting a category, uh, praying for, and that you, uh, where you are silently or aloud, uh, filling in uh, people, places, things that you're praying for in that particular category. So just to let you know that we'll be praying for the Willow Methodist Church, for people who are suffering, uh, for the Willow and the Willow community and the Natsu Valley and then the world and its leaders and then also the church itself, the church universal and ending the communion of saints. We get to this prayer beginning with these words. New every morning is your love, great God of light, and all day long you are working for good in the world. Stir up in us desire to serve you, to live peacefully with our neighbors, and to devote each day to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. Together, let us pray for the people of Willow United Methodist Church. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Together, let us pray for those who suffer and those in trouble. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. Together, let us pray for the concerns of the Willow community and the Mat, Matsu Valley community, the Matsu Borough, and the state of Alaska. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Together, let us pray for the world, its people, and its leaders. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Together, let us pray for the Church Universal, its leaders, its members, and its mission. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And together, let us pray for the communion of saints. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. And it is as children of Jesus that we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
I invite you to sing and pass it on. join together in the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Our time of worship this morning has come to an end, and yet our week of worship is just beginning. We pray that this service has been a blessing for you. And we also invite you at this time, as we do at the end of every service, to be generous. To be generous with yourself and with your church and with your community. If you would like to send in tithes and offerings, that can, those could be sent to Willow United Methodist, P.O. Box 182, Willow, Alaska. We pray that you will have a blessed week. 
Know that you are loved. Know that you are God's masterpiece. Amen and amen.